In this episode, I fail to move fast enough, turn my trims up to 11, Engine out. And Chris has his third and fourth engine out. Fuck. Booties. So the next three episodes are going to be based on three days we managed to get flying again. Finally we had some sunshine, look here. So me and Martin managed to, we managed to get three days down the field and Chris joined us on the first day, here's Chris, um, and uh, he turned up, he said well you know I've got a shift at eight or six in the uh, evening so I really need to do something so he wanted to do an XC across to a place called Hunstanton which, which is about 30 miles away. As this map shows there's our field in yellow and we're going to go around the coast there. So I flunk two forward launchers to start with and uh, I was just kind of exhausted after those flunking those two launchers. Chris was helping me as you can see here and it also had 10 litres of fuel on board. I'd never had that much weight on my back before. So they took off before me and circled above waiting for me to get in the air again. I flunked another launch and I was just so exhausted I thought no I let them go. I was a bit apprehensive about the whole thing anyway. So anyway, I gave them a sign, they flew off. I had a nice relax, and then I managed this takeoff, which I think was takeoff 31, forward launch, and oh, I'm happy with this one. It was a very nice, very nice launch. Look at that, blue sky, warmth. I think it's the first time I've, well, maybe the second time I've actually flown in warm conditions. It's always been gloves and oh, thermals, this and that. This time I managed to put my trims out to 11. So here we are, 2,000 feet, and uh, King's Lynn approaching underneath. Oh, potential landing zone over there, I'd land in there. Farm over there, I think. See some steam coming up in the uh, over King's Lynn, and it's just going straight up, so you can it is very little wind. Very little wind indeed. I suppose the better thing about an alternative landing zone is a greenhouse over there. That's a good choice, I think. Not in it, obviously, but... So here I'm looking over towards Hunstanton along the coast, but I can't see them. can't see them at all. I can't see them anywhere. You'd think you'd see them from here, wouldn't you? And I circled around for a good good 20 minutes waiting, hoping to see them. So little did I realise Chris had had an engine out again. I'd flown with him a few months before and I think it was flight four or five he was on and we were talking on comms and he suddenly said engine out, engine out at about 1200 feet and I thought is he joking? Is this some kind of joke? No, he said I'm not joking at all and after my experience of hitting a shed, oh god I'm going to put the link at the top right hand corner again, I said whatever you do don't panic it's never going to be that bad you, you've got plenty of distance, sorry enough height and shorter distance to glide back to the airfield so I followed him talking him trying to keep him calm and he did a superb landing it was just on the edge of the airfield uh, at that point I was struggling myself to land and I just thought, sod, under all that pressure he manages to do a good landing. And of course the second time he had an engine out was flying over Hunstanton. And he's allowed me to share this footage with you which he took. There we are, he's flying with several other people, they're up ahead of him. He's coming in and he said one of his biggest mistakes was the fact that he was flying at trim 6 or whatever and he hadn't really, he should have pulled his trims in so if anything happened he was already slow enough to land. So he's circling about here and suddenly his engine died. Engine oh, out! Whoops. 
Oh, fuck. And in a lot of wet, nasty sand. But at least it wasn't the sea. Anyway, so what went wrong? Well, basically, he flies a bulldog. And this is an unusual setup for a bulldog. It's got two tanks. And the idea is you fill both up and the petrol sucks up into the carburetor, but as it sucks it creates a vacuum in one tank which then sucks on the other, and the idea is it stops the petrol sloshing about and keeps the weight balance more. But of course if you've got an air leak between the two, or not a perfect seal, then you end up only sucking the fuel from one tank. So probably two mistakes to learn from here. He pushed it too much, he should have pulled those trims in, which would have made him slightly slower when he came in, and if anything had gone wrong then he would have landed easily. Of course his wing was full of sand so he had to put in the bath and uh, give it a good rinse. A lot of sand came out of that. So Chris had an engine out here at the airfield, Hunt Stanton, and then unknown to me and while I was circling above trying to find them, he had an engine out at a golf course and uh, he came into land and face planted in front of a load of golfers. He thought that they might be a little bit hostile to the fact he sport their game, but uh, because, because he landed on his face, they, they, they really did pity him. So again, it was down to exactly the same thing. The fuel wasn't transferring, so they managed to transfer the fuel to the other tank. He managed to take off and fly out of there. Unfortunately, he then had exactly the same problem, only three miles away from the airfield. So basically this is four, four engine outs he's had. So I was circling around, didn't realise he was in trouble. He did phone me twice, but like I say, because my Senna wasn't paired with my phone, it just rang and I just shouted, can't hear a word you're saying. Anyway, beautiful day, look at that. So I'm here circling over Kings Lynn, that's the river down there. And now we're coming in. I'm not going to bore you with a, with a flying in the next sea. So now we're pulling in the trims, coming into land again. Yeah, so I'm pulling the brakes wrong there. I should have put my finger in the loop on the end. And it's so easy to hit the kill switch while you're messing around with all this. Jesus. And of course, when you release the brakes, sorry, when you release the trims, the brakes go higher and higher, so you can't reach the brakes. You use tip steering at that point. Which was the first time I'd done all that. So I did that all on my own. No big deal, but... <sighs> Again, is something that you, you know, you're fearful of when you start, I guess. Anyway, come in for a beautiful landing, look at this. I was happy with this. Oh yes, oh yes. Keep it going. Which way are we going, left? Yeah. yeah. Left. <laughs> so then I attempted to take off again. This is flight 32, I think it is. And uh, oh dear, not enough movement, not enough movement. Because above me hesitated too much. Now let's try again, let's try again. Give me a bit of weather there. Comes up nice. Comes up nice. Move, move, move. Not leaning back enough. Which is creating the thrust line downward rather than upwards. Needs to be. Oh boy. Well, I don't suppose it was too bad. In conclusion, what did we learn? Yeah, we've got to thank Chris for sharing that footage with us. And he just wanted me to point out, you know, we all need to learn from his experience. As you come in low like that, you need to be prepared for any um, emergency. He should have brought his trims in in preparation for, you know, that possibility. Of course, I think, really, we were very silly to try and do that on day one. I wasn't really particularly that happy with going all the way to Hunt Stanton. Um, 
and having had two fuel outs previous he should have really ensured that his, his, his equipment was working 100% before embarking on such a long journey yet again.